Thank you. So today is my um, my Mother's Day sermon. <laughs> I know uh, tomorrow's not Mother's Day. It's a week from tomorrow, but I will not be here next uh, Sabbath. So just a simple Mother's Day message today. You know, the daily grind of motherhood, I think, can be summed up in a short Mother's Day story. Are you ready for it? So uh, a son, teenage son, went to wake his mom up in, on, on Mother's Day morning. He wakes his mom up. Actually, his mom was already awake. She was laying there, and, and he said, Mom, you're just laying here awake. What, what's going on? What's wrong? Well, she says, I'm not feeling very well. My head, my stomach, you know, just not feeling good. And he's like, well, I know it's Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day. And, and you don't have to worry if you don't feel good enough to cook. If you don't feel good enough uh, to get downstairs, I'll carry you down to the stove so you can cook. <laughs> and isn't that the, the daily grind of, of being a mom? <laughs> it doesn't matter how you feel. You've got to do it. <laughs> doesn't matter what's going on. Um, and, and there's just those days. And I've being a dad is hard, but uh, being a mother is harder, I think. Um, parenting is hard. You know, they say that saying, like, it's not that hard, it's not rocket science. They shouldn't say that. They should say it's not that hard, it's not parenting. <laughs> I mean, parenting is the hard thing of life. I think it's one of the very hardest things in, in all of life. Uh, so today, we honor you mothers out there, um, today and eight days from today especially, um, for your time and your love and your commitment so at times it may feel like no one sees you. Uh, being a mother can be a really, really thankless job. Uh, especially if um, it seems like in other areas of life you get the praise and the kudos. Or for my wife, she stays at home and, and I'm out getting, you know, getting appreciated and she's at home. It's a thankless job. Um, but I have news that, that Jesus sees you. Jesus sees you. Jesus knows. Um, Jesus made a habit of meeting women where they are and paying special attention to women during his ministry on earth. You can read so many accounts of him speaking to women directly and, and coming. And that was during a day and time when people didn't do that, when that was taboo, especially like the woman at the well and all of that. And, you know, I love how Ellen White talks about being a mother and she talks specifically even to, to wives of ministers. And she says, your job is as important as his, if not more important. And I believe it's more important. Um, Andy Stanley, a preacher, said it this way. He said, your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do. It may be someone you raise. And that's the truth. If, if, mothers, if you're able to raise your kid to, to love Jesus and love people, you've done more than a pastor or evangelist ever could. Pastors and evangelists, they can get people into churches, but they don't really change that person's character. You're building character as a parent, as a mother. You're building character, and if you do that successfully, by the grace of God, it's only by the grace of God, but if by the grace of God you're able to shape that kid to love Jesus and love the, love the people in this world, man, that is a huge contribution to the kingdom of God. So many of us need to do a better job all year round of appreciating the mothers in our lives. But at least now, this time of year, today and, and next Sunday, uh, our hats are off to you, mothers. So thank you so much for all that you do. Our hearts also go out today to all of the ladies and girls, even if you're not a mother. Um, some may wish they could be mothers. Some may be mothers someday. Some wish they could be mothers and, and haven't been able to for all sorts of reasons, and our heart goes out to all of those people. And, and every woman in this room, you are a part of an important community of, of uh, people because it really does take a village to raise a child. So we appreciate the contributions, not only of mothers, but aunties and, and um, et cetera. So... It really does take a village to raise a child. Let's uh, bow our heads in prayer and open the word of God. Father in heaven, continue to be with us now. We thank you that you're with us. Open our hearts. Um, 
direct my speech and open our hearts to receive a message from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 49. The prophet Isaiah chapter 49. And while you're turning there, I'll give you a little bit of context about this prophet in this book, Isaiah 49. Throughout his lifetime, Isaiah witnessed the fall of Israel to the armies of Assyria. Little by little, things got worse. Piece by piece, more and more of Israel was taken over by the armies of Assyria. When he was born, Israel was free, but when he was a young man, they captured the northern part. When, when he was a little bit older, they captured the entire northern kingdom. And by the time uh, Isaiah was an old man, he witnessed them almost capture Jerusalem. But by the grace of God, they didn't. But, but he saw this huge decline, and he saw essentially the beginning of the exile. So many of Isaiah's prophecies have to do with this exile that's coming and then that became a reality during his lifetime, and chapter 49 is no exception. This chapter points to God's plan of restoration, not only for Israel, but also the light that should go to the all the nations that he wishes to bring to himself. And we're going to look kind of at the last half of the chapter. In verse 13, um, this is kind of concludes the praise that goes before it. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth. Break out into singing, O mountains. It's this joy, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. This joy is happening. But the Israelites are noticing a discrepancy. It's like, here, God, you're promising all of this great stuff, but we're still in exile. Our land is desolate. Our our cities are in ruins and our children are off exiled into other nations. How can we be joyful and sing when all this is happening? So they raise this objection. They say, the Lord has forgotten us. And that's in verse 14. Let's keep reading. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child? This was our scripture reading. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Every now and then you read about a mother forgetting their child somewhere. In 2009, a mother forgot her child. In she was flying on an airplane. In this, the airplane was coming from Saudi Arabia, uh, headed to Malaysia. She realized while she was on the plane that she forgot her baby in the airport. Can you imagine? Um, fortunately, the story does have a happy ending. The plane actually turned around for that baby's child, for that woman's child, went back to Saudi Arabia, and she was reunited. <laughs> Occasionally, you read about this, right? People forget their kids in, in car seats at the grocery store, all this stuff. By the way, I've heard that a good way to not do that is every time you get in your car, take off your shoe and put it in the back seat with the kid. <laughs> I don't know if that works, but I've never tried it, because then my thought is like, well, what if I get in that habit, and then one time I forget to take off my shoe? Then I'll for sure get the, forget the kid in the car seat. So I haven't done that, but if that's a problem for you, there's uh, things you can do, memory tricks you can try. But Isaiah's asking a rhetorical question here, right? Can a woman forget their baby? What do you think, those of you who are moms? What's, what's the answer to that question? Can you forget your child? No, right? No, I mean, yes, technically it happens, but it's unlikely. It's rare. People don't forget their kids. Moms love their kids. I think the love of a mom for a kid is, is probably the strongest of all loves known to humanity. It's the strongest love humanity knows. But moms are not perfect, and that's the point. That's the point of this. God is perfect. God is the perfect mother, the only perfect mother. Jesus literally inscribed us on the palms of his hands as he hung on the cross. God is the perfect mother. Now, some of you may feel uneasy with me saying that God is a mother, <laughs> but the Bible does portray a maternal side of God. 
pictures of God are painted in Scripture that show him having motherly attributes. For example, let's go through just a few examples. In many places, God has said to shelter his children under his wings, like a, like a mother hen does or an eagle would. Psalm 91, 4, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. Jesus was drawing on that imagery, right? When he wept over Jerusalem and he said, how often I've wanted to gather you under my wings as a hen, and you, as a, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. God also compares himself in Hosea to a mama bear who's been robbed of her cubs. Think of that, that, that maternal instinct, that vengeance, that that wanting to save the kids. In Deuteronomy, it says that God gave birth to Israel. That's Deuteronomy 32, 18. And in Isaiah, God says that he will comfort his people like a mother comforts her children. It's actually a whole passage. And in that passage, there's even imagery of, of a nursing mother. And speaking of breastfeeding, the word in Hebrew for breast is shad. And so many scholars actually believe that the name El Shaddai is connected to that. Could it be that the, the name El Shaddai is connected to breasts? If that's the case, then, then the name El Shaddai is, is painting a very nurturing, motherly picture of who God is. That he even nurses his children. I remember becoming a dad and, and seeing my kids nurse for the first time and, and seeing them nurse as they, you know, as they were babies. And, and it's just powerful to see how a child can be so upset about life and so disturbed and nothing's right, and nothing's right until that baby is, is back on the breast, you know? And it's just like this, this picture of us and God, that he nurtures us when nothing is okay. When the whole world is falling apart, we're upset, we're going crazy, he comforts us in a way that only, only a mother can. And that's the picture that's being painted of God. So the Bible does paint a maternal picture of God. In fact, some people have counted at least 26 times in the Bible where uh, feminine or maternal imagery is used to describe God. Now, please don't understand. I'm not saying God is a woman. I'm not saying we should start using the word she instead of he or anything like that. But the Bible does paint a picture of God with maternal attributes, with motherly characteristics. And I think now, Mother's Day, this is, this is the time to recognize that and to think about that and to meditate on the fact that, yes, God is the perfect father, but he's also a perfect mother. And he parents us in a, in a complete way, in, only a way, in a way that only a mother could. So I think the Bible describes God in feminine terms, not because God is a woman, technically, or, or anything like that, but because feminine or maternal traits say something true about God. And they say something true about that person's relationship with God, Isaiah's relationship as he wrote that. Furthermore, I think it's high time that we recognize that both men and women are created in the image of God, equally, right? The Bible says, uh, Genesis 127, God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. So God's not a woman, but Technically, he's not really a man either, right? I mean, the Bible calls him our father and uses masculine pronouns, he, him, his, and I think we should do the same. Uh, but God doesn't have a, a Y chromosome, does he? <laughs> he doesn't have um, reproductive organs of either gender, does he? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so for Mother's Day, let's, let's think about God as, as a mother as well as a father. Yes, he's a father, but he's also the perfect mother, the only perfect mother. So back to our passage in Isaiah 49. God goes on talking in the next few verses about the children of the Israelites, the future generations, and how after the exile, after the destruction, after the pain, they will return. And in verse 19, God makes a crazy promise. He says that the land will be too small for all the people who are going to return. And this is unfathomable for the Israelites. When the exile took place, many were killed. Many were taken to foreign lands. They were scattered. The land was empty, desolate. And now God is saying that not only will they come back, but there won't be enough room to contain all the people that will come back. Verse 21 describes the shock of the Israelites when God does this. Let's read it. Verse 21, Isaiah 49, 21. Then you will say in your heart, who has begotten these for me? 
since I have lost my children and am desolate, a captive and wandering to and fro. And who has brought these up? There I was, left alone. But these, where were they? Do you get that picture? They're like, where did all these kids come from? God continues making promises in the next few verses. He says the nations are literally going to carry your sons and daughters back. uh, Kings will be their foster parents until they make it to you. Queens will be their nursing mamas. You can read it. Then those kings and queens are going to bow down in front of the Israelites and lick the dust off their feet. Wow, right? These promises must have sounded outlandish to the Israelites, and maybe they sound a little bit outlandish to us. But that's the kind of God we serve, a kind of God who wants to do outlandish things to save us and outlandish things to save our children. Let's pick it up in verse 24, Isaiah 49, 24. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives of the righteous be delivered? But thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible be delivered. For I will... This is verse 25. For I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. Amen, Amen to that. I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh. I will, they shall be drunk with their own blood as with, a sweet, as with sweet wine. All flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Friend, God's, God fights for you. God fights for you. God fights for your children. Isaiah asks another rhetorical question here in verse 24, and the logical answer is no. You can't rip the prey away from a mighty animal or a mighty army. You just can't. But with God, the answer is yes, and that's what he's going to do. Now, of course, the original context here is talking about the Assyrians, talking about the Babylonians and the descendants of Israel. But And so God promises to fight those armies, to deliver the children of Israel from uh, those armies, to bring them back to the land, to save, to redeem. But this promise also applies to us, to you. The one who fights against us is the evil one, Satan. He fights against our children, and in many cases, unfortunately, he has captured them as his prey. They have marks, scratches, bruises from what he's done to them, the cruelty he's inflicted. And although we in our strength can do absolutely nothing about that sometimes, God can. And God promises to. He promises to fight against the one who fights against us, to deliver our children, to bring them back, to save, to redeem. God fights for you. So mothers, (laughs) when the day is just starting and you're already exhausted and the kids aren't behaving, God fights for you. And fathers, when you notice that your your kid has the same character defects you have and you have no idea what to do about it, can you tell him speaking from experience? God fights for you. God fights for those children. And to those of you who aren't parents with adult children, perhaps, you see the mistakes you made. Or maybe you have no clue why your children made some of the bad decisions they've made. God fights for you. God fights for those children. And for those of you who are not parents, of course, this applies to you too. God fights for you and God fights for your loved ones. I'd like uh, Carlisle to pass out that. Thank you. There he is. I'm passing around a sheet. And this has a... Thank you, John, Carlisle, everyone. This, uh, This sheet has prayers. I think, so God is fighting for our children, and God calls us to join in that fight with him. We are, we are to be fighting alongside of God for the salvation of our kids, and the best way to fight is through prayer. These are our weapons. Our weapons are not carnal. Our weapons are spiritual, and our weapon is prayer. And so the sheet, actually, could one of you bring one to me? <laughs> Thank you. The sheet has... Um, Prayers that are specifically for our our children, but they can be for anyone. You can pray them for yourself. You can pray them for your loved ones. Thank you. And you'll notice on the back, I did put the source. Uh, This is from a blog 
called the Faithful Moms blog that authors Erica Dawson. But it's really just scripture. If you look through, it's, it's scripture. And I just like the way she arranged it, the, like the way she put it together into these five prayers. So really quickly, I'd like to, to read through these and look at them. First one, praying for our children's salvation, identity, and purpose. And this is from Paul's prayer. Paul, Paul, Paul's prayer for the Ephesian believers. At the bottom, you can see the reference. Lord God, I fall to my knees before you. I'm going to put my, my children's names in. Asking that out of your glorious unlimited resources, you will empower Wesley with inner strength through your spirit so that you, Jesus, may dwell in her heart, his heart, through faith, making your permanent home there. May... Colette, be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love so that she may have the power to apprehend and grasp with all of God's devoted people the extravagant dimensions of your love, how wide and long and high and deep your love is. May Wesley actually experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses simply knowing about you, that he may be filled in all his being with the richest measure of your presence and become a person who is wholly filled and flooded by you. Lord, allow Colette to live a, a full life, full in the fullness of you. Amen. The second one. You, well, actually, we're not going to read them all right now. <laughs> praying for our children's salvation. That one's pretty short. Three, praying for your children's character, heart, and actions. Flip it over. Four, praying for our children's desires and love of God's word. Five, praying for our children's faith and submission to God. Take this home. Pray for your child. Uh, and I think praying scripture is powerful because these are the promises of God. They aren't just things you're making up or praying out of your own brain, although that's important too. But this is the specific promise of God, and you're claiming that promise. You're taking the check to the bank. God's, God's written us a check, but you have to cash it. And, and that check, you know, it has blank, the, the money line. You can take it and you can ask for $12 for your kids. You can ask that your kid will ha get a good job. That's a good thing, and you should ask that. But if you ask this, then you're writing a million dollars on that check. You're taking it to the bank, and he will. He will hear and answer your prayers. Of course, your children have um, freedom of choice. So whenever you pray for someone else, you have to know that that person also has the freedom of choice. And so because of their freedom of choice, God will not violate their freedom of choice. But I pray that he'll do everything but violate their freedom of choice. Um, he won't violate their freedom of choice, so the prayer may not be answered the way you want it to be. It may not be answered in this lifetime, but he is hearing, and he is answering, and he is working as hard as he can in the context of the great controversy without violating their freedom of choice. He will answer your prayer. And so, today that's my message, that God fights for you, God fights for your children, and God calls you to participate in that fight for your children. You can participate in so many ways, and I, I pray that we all participate in fighting for our kids in the ways we can, according to their ages. If they're young, that we're, we're bringing them up in the way of the Lord, we're teaching them about God, we're having family worship, that's so important, things like that. If they're, if they're older, you're reaching out to them in other ways. But we can all and should all be doing this. And again, if you don't have kids, you pray, put your own name in there. I would put my name in there. These are things I want for myself, too. Put your name in there. Put the name of your loved one. Put the name of whoever it is you're fighting for. And that's what I'd like to ask you today. God fights for you. God fights for your children if you're a parent. But what about you? Who is it that God, that you need God to fight for today? The first answer is you need God to fight for you. And he's doing that. But who else is it? Think about it. It may be your kids if you're a parent, but there's others too. Maybe your parents. Maybe your mom on Mother's Day. Maybe friends, neighbors, etc. Think about it. Put that person's name in here and claim these promises of God for these individuals. God fights for you. God fights for your children. Amen. And let's sing our closing prayer. Closing uh,
song, which is kind of a prayer too, our closing song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, number 100. Great is Thy Faithfulness.